Good morning. I'm Ezekiel Hunt, and I welcome you to Prairie View A&M University. For this special occasion, I would like to tell you why we are here. We're here to have a conversation. We're here to talk about Up Home, the memoir of a living legend here at Prairie View, Dr. Ruth the Truth Simmons. We're here to see how one can ascend from the cotton fields of East Texas to the halls of Ivy League schools and premier HBCUs across the country, and how one can truly be a history maker. We're here to see how to break the chains of circumstance and shape one's authentic life with unbound hands. And lastly, we're here for wisdom on how to curate and cultivate community a theme that is sure to resonate with many of us in attendance. I find myself in this auspicious community as a witness and survivor of calamities of my own. In Southern California, I went to more black funerals than graduations and saw that most state institutions serving young black people were laced with barbed wire and electric fences. It was through a coalescence of coincidences that I found myself in Prairie View just in time to catch a glimpse of the Toni Morrison writing program, the brainchild of Dr. Ruth J. Simmons and Dr. Thomas Smith. This has ignited my creativity in telling my story in a way that no one else can, just like Ruth. Immediately, I could sense that something was different here. After a year, I can say that far more than simply producing productive people, the Hill fosters future leadership, incubates innovation, and breathes life into black brilliance. This community is triumphant. Up Home speaks the triumph that transcends the boundaries and pitfalls of a patently inequitable society. Patriarchy, crony capitalism, racism. The systems that contextualize our lives do not necessarily have to define our lives. As we sit, stand here today, as listeners and observers, I'm compelled to emphasize that we, like our prolific conversationalists, are authors of our own accounts. We have the call to navigate the dynamic landscapes of society. We have the call to transform past cycles into arcs of a better future. Our distinguished women of honor, with both their work and their words today, are sure to amplify that call. To welcome you all, I'm pleased to introduce the Dean of the Marvin D. and June Samuel Brailsford College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Dory J. Gilbert. Good morning, everyone. As Dean of the Marvin D. and June Samuel Brailsford College of Arts and Sciences, I am delighted to welcome all of you to today to this event, which marks this year's opening of the Toni Morrison Writing Program events. Launched two years ago, the Toni Morrison Writing Program has hosted prominent authors who have enriched our students and our campus community through master classes, public readings, and meaningful conversations that transform the way we see the world. Today, we continue that tradition. We open this year's programming with a most special guest author, President Merita, eighth president, and the first woman to hold the position of president at Prairie View A&M University, Dr. Ruth J. Simmons. Dr. Simmons, from all of us, welcome back to our campus as our guest author. Welcome back to the Hill. In fact, the Toni Morrison Writing Program was established at Purview by Dr. Simmons in honor of the late Toni Morrison and her former student philanthropist, Mackenzie Scott. 
The program upholds the legacy of African American writers, especially those educated at HBCUs. We are also very excited to welcome Ms. Juliana Richardson, founder and president of the History Makers. Ms. Richardson established her legacy pursuing her goal to educate the world on the accomplishments of African Americans. The idea to start the History Makers was a response to nearly a century of undocumented African American accomplishments and struggles. Yesterday, Ms. Richardson spent time with our faculty and staff who are engaged in history maker projects here at Prairie View, including projects connected to the Ruth J. Simmons Center for Race and Justice. Up Home, One Girl's Journey unveils the inspirational story of one extraordinary African-American woman. And today, we will learn more about the legend behind that story through the synergistic conversation with a phenomenal champion of African-American history. For certain, the conversation that will unfold today is historic. I want to thank Dr. Joanna Thomas-Smith, Provost Emerita, and Director of the Toni Morrison Program for arranging this event along with the Toni Morrison Planning Committee and others who have worked together to bring us here today. And now, for the opening remarks, it is my honor to invite to the stage our esteemed ninth president and the second woman to hold the office of president at Purview a and University, Dr. Tamikia P. Legrand. President <laughs> Legrand. Thank you. Good morning. What a pleasure it is to be here today for such a monumental occasion. Please join me again in a rousing round of applause to welcome the incomparable Dr. Ruth J. Simmons, eighth president of Prairie View University, back to the Hill. Today, the Prairie View University community is once again a beneficiary of Dr. Simmons' presence and wisdom by engaging in a conversation about her recently published memoir, Up Home, One Girl's Story. As I am rounding out my first 100 plus days on the Hill and continuing to learn more about our great university, a question that I have frequently been asked is how it feels to occupy the seat that was recently held by a trailblazer and history maker. Now, certainly, I understand the question. After all, Dr. Simmons has served as president and CEO of three universities. She is the first African-American woman to have served as president of an Ivy League university. She is the first woman to have held the presidency at Prairie View A&M University. She is world-renowned as an academic, a Fulbright Fellow, the recipient of over 40 honorary doctorate degrees, and Time Magazine has cited her as America's best college president. Her accomplishments, please applaud. Her accomplishments are extensive. So yes, I understand the curiosity around my feelings about being the ninth president at Prairie View. But I will tell you honestly, when I think of the paths charted by Dr. Simmons, the word that comes to mind is inspiration. Inspiration and appreciation. And those feelings have only deepened as I have pondered excerpts from her memoir. The memoir is a reminder of a woman who has achieved far more academically and professionally than many women of her generation. In a poem, President, President Emerita Simmons acutely demonstrates the power and promise of education. Through education, we have the ability to transform ourselves, to impact others, to disrupt old patterns, ideals, and ways of thinking. It's so easy 
to be content and complacent. It's easy to accept what is and has always been, but education pushes us to see the possibilities of more. It challenges us to keep evolving, to keep daring, to keep discovering, innovating, and thriving until we become more than we could ever have envisioned. First Lady Michelle Obama once said, history has shown us that courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own. All of us are beneficiaries of Dr. Simmons' contagious courage. And just as she has been an inspiration to us, it is my fierce hope that today from this conversation, we each walk away with nuggets of truth that prompt our deeper self-reflection and commitment to inspiring ourselves and the next generation to be courageous change makers. Dr. Simmons, thank you for the life lessons that you have shared so honestly and transparently. You have showed us, shown us that we are not hindered by what has been, but instead emboldened by the possibilities of what can be. Even when one is not exactly sure of the path, we can still choose to be bold, fearless and ambitious in moving forward. Mentors and role models, as well as resilience, are invaluable to define pathways to the life and experiences desired. Throughout your life's work, you have planted great seeds, and your harvest is indeed plentiful. Thank you for coming back to share with us today. We all eagerly await the conversation. Thank you. What an environment we have here. We have an abundance of phenomenal women speaking here today. And as we move to introduce our conversationalists, I'd like to take the opportunity to recognize the magnitude of this event. Here we are on the grounds of what was once the Alta Vista Plantation, and now today, surrounded by brilliant black scholars and leaders. This is a testament to triumph. With that being said, I'd like to pass the mic to a classmate of mine, a fellow psychology major, Prairie View's finest, Delisha Lachelle Drain. Good morning. I am Delisha Lachelle Drain, a passionate psychology major in the honors program from Indiana by way of South Texas. It is an honor for me to have been asked to introduce two truly phenomenal women, Ms. Juliana Richardson and Dr. Ruth J. Simmons. Brief biographies of each are in the program, but I feel compelled to tell you something about each of them that I found not only appealing, but inspiring. Everyone in this auditorium has heard discussions about African American history's place in the school curriculum, library, or everyday life. Like Dr. Simmons, Ms. Juliana Richardson is a well-educated professional, completing her undergraduate degree at Brandeis and earning her law degree from Harvard University. Growing up in Ohio and being the only African-American student in her school, her knowledge of African-American history was limited. Like many youths today, she knew of the educator Booker T. Washington and the activists Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, However, she felt there must be more stories about African Americans' influences throughout history. She realized that there was something wrong with that. But it was a college oral history research proje project on the Harlem Renaissance and Langston Hughes that confirmed her idea that there was more African American achievers out there. While arriving as a well-successful cable network entrepreneur and corporate executive, Ms. Richardson started uncovering vibrant stories of African Americans. Sometimes they were not far away, but they might as well have been because their stories had never been recorded. If they left letters, papers, or patents, no one preserved them. 
appearing on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, she stated that she found her calling in setting out to collect and preserve the oral histories of African Americans because what is valued is recorded and preserved. It matters. 23 years ago, she created the History Makers, based in Chicago, collecting, archiving, the histories of the likes of Katherine J. Johnson, Barack Obama, General Colin Powell, and others speak to Ms. Richardson's life purpose, which is protecting the value of black individuals by bringing their stories to light. I truly think she sees a piece of herself in the heart of everyone she interviews, and that's why she is so committed to preserving the rhythm and soul of black makers of history. Last year, I was fortunate enough to have been an ambassador for the History Makers Digital Archive on campus, which captures the stories of the well-known and the unsung notables. Watching Ms. Richardson's work inspired me and taught me so much about the richness of African American history. She taught me how to see myself in, the, in these people and that history is like a mirror. Ms. Juliana Richardson is the master. She is caring and discerning in a way that respects and honors the story of struggle and success. So if you would join me in giving her a round of applause. It is clear why Dr. Thomas Smith invited Ms. Richardson to lead the conversation with Dr. Simmons about her book, Up Home, One Girl's Journey. Dr. Simmons had made history and done it despite the circumstances that made it seemingly impossible. There's no question as to why it made the New York Times editor choice last week, has been featured on the Today Show, and is being written about in major outlets throughout history. But today we get to hear that coming of age story of a history maker who would later be, become affectionately known as Ruth the Truth. It is common knowledge that the eighth president of Prairie View A&M University, Dr. Ruth J. Simmons, is highly educated, earning her bachelor's degree from Dillard University and her doctorate from Harvard University. In 1995, she was appointed the ninth president of Smith College, the first African American to lead one of the seven sisters institutions. However, this wouldn't be the first glass ceiling that she would shatter throughout her career. She made history again in 2001 by becoming the first African American president of an Ivy League institution when she was appointed as the eighth, 18th president of Brown University. In fact, Brown University renamed its Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, the Ruth J. Simmons Center for Race and Justice, in celebration of the center's 10th anniversary. She's traveled the world, mastered the French language, and served on numerous prestigious boards like the Square, Goldman Sachs, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Federal Reserve Bank, the Houston branch. One wonders where she puts all the citations and honors, honorary doctorates that she received for her remarkable career and impact. Her achievements I admire, but more than that, I marvel at her, breath at her breaking the glass ceiling and pulling others up behind her. After a lengthy, illustrious career, when many would be retiring to leisure, she found joy in coming back to Prairie View because she believed that HBCU students are highly capable and deserve opportunities to realize their potential fully. She saw us students and the potential we possess and she decided to invest her time, love, and passion for higher education in us. By becoming the type of leader that she admired as a child, Dr. Simmons makes her students feel safe and welcomed while still giving the tough love needed to make mistakes and grow into productive Panthers capable of changing the world. A professor, a president, a higher education luminary, and now an author, Up Home, One Girl's Journey reveals a Ruth J. Simmons we could never have imagined. It proves that where we start need not dictate where we arrive in this life. Today, an accomplished woman opens before us the joy, the pain, the trials, the, trumpet, the triumphs of her life story from childhood to the first milestone, college completion. Ms. Richardson and Dr. Simmons, you have our full attention as we learn the origins of Up Home, One Girl's Journey.
great. Does it feel familiar? <laughs> it feels wonderful. And I'm going to ask my daughter uh, to look in my purse and throw me some tissues up here because <laughs> I don't think I can get through this without crying. My oh. sister always worries and is embarrassed because I cry a lot. And so I might, I might embarrass her today. Oh, thank oh, you. There. Oh, here, I'll, here, I'll grab them. Thank you. You know, I've had a marvelous time on this campus. Um, and I really want to thank Dr. Emmett, uh, Joanne, uh, Thomas Smith, and the, the faculty and staff that I met here. And just a really wonderful campus. I also uh, want to thank Dr. Uh, LeGrand, the ninth president. Um, you know, it was December 3rd, 2019 that I traveled here to interview you. It, start an affiliation, as Alicia was saying, that continues to the day. Now, you told me at that time when we were asking, we always asked about favorites, that your favorite foods were chicken enchiladas with rice and refried beans and gumbo with no shrimp because you're <laughs> allergic to shrimp and all farm to table foods that your favorite uh, color was red and your favorite place to vacation was your beloved France. As I told you, I, I mean, up home is, it's really special. It's captivating. It shows your really extraordinary journey. And the name given to you, the, I would say that the name of the book should have been Ruth the Truth. <laughs> because it is authentic and brutally honest. I want to ask you about the title and uh, what you learned in the process of writing it. Well, the, hello everybody. I'm so happy to be with you this morning. Um, it really feels like coming home. Um, I was born in a small town in East Texas that is north of Houston. And we go back to this small town um, with some frequency. And it always holds a place in our hearts that's that's very important and very dear because it has all those memories of people that we loved and of times when we grew up together. But it's north, and so when we say we're going there, we say we're going up home. And among us, when we say that, we all know what we're talking about. We're going up home, right? Now, some people would say, you know, down home, if they're going south, I suppose. Uh, but up home is a place to me that means something important and um, something that I want never, ever to forget. I want to ask you um, of that place because it was named daily, right? It's, yes. Um, and if you could sort of describe the town, but I also in the description, I'd like to know what sights, smells, and sounds remind you of growing up. <laughs> Well, there was not much there um, because Daly was what we call a community. The town nearby was called Grapeland because of all the grapes that grew wild there. Um, and what I recall as a very young child of that were the, the, the smell of the field. I don't know how many of you have been on farms, but there is something wonderful about our proximity to the earth and how it smells when crops are being uh, prepared and harvested and so on, and when the rain comes and, you, and the dirt. Um, this area is known for c very clay soil, um, and so it's very red, uh, very red dirt. So I, I think of those smells. I think of some of the wild grasses um, that grew. Uh, and since we had very little food, uh, we became enamored of the wild um, edible plants that uh, were around us. And so some of them had a somewhat acrid smell. Um, and, uh, and so I can smell that um, in, you know, in my memory. 
Um, and most of all, uh, I smell my mother's cooking. And, um, you know, in those days, well, I have to say that this is not true, by the way, but my sisters and brothers continue to chide me because they feel I don't cook enough. <laughs> um, and they sometimes say they think maybe I can't cook, but I'm an excellent cook. I want to, I want to say that. <laughs> but um, for my mother, my mother seemed to me to cook all day long. First of all, there's breakfast. Um, and, you know, there were not a lot of convenient um, things for pre preparing food. And so everything was done um, to the nth degree um, with great um, toil. <laughs> In some, in some cases. Um, we would prepare the food. That might mean slaughtering animals to, um, to, to prepare the food. Uh, it might mean picking the greens um, and so forth. And it certainly would mean, you know, sitting on the porch and shelling peas and preparing. The, all of that we had to do. I mean, you go to the store and you buy frozen stuff that's already done. But my mother was doing all of this all day long, it seemed to me. And so the smells uh, in the house. But I, I especially love the idea of the things that she canned. Um, because, you know, without refrigeration, uh, the kind we have today, in order to have something in the winter, you would have to prepare something um, uh, for uh, with, during the growing season that you could uh, eat during the winter. And so she would, she would can fruits and um, all kinds of vegetables and so forth. And when she was doing this, you, th those smells filled the house. I thought she was a genius um, because of, you know, looking at, the, um, at all the jars aligned on the shelves. It just seemed that she could work magic somehow. So those are the sounds um, and, and smells of my childhood. And, it, isn't it odd that we hold those um, close to us for so long in our lives and so many years later, 70 years later, to be able to remember that so vividly? And that's one reason I was drawn to the French author, Michel, uh, Marcel Proust. And I don't know if you know Marcel Proust, but he's very famous for one incident in his book. And that is, he describes taking a sip of tea and out of this cup of tea arose a memory from his childhood that was so vivid. And a lot of people recall that incident when they're talking about memories from, um, that, are, that are evoked by uh, smells. You know, you make it sound, you know, it sounds like farm to table today, but it was really hard, hard conditions. In fact, your family is here. Can your family stand up? Can the family stand up so everybody can see you? Come on, get up. I know I was telling Nora and Arthur that they, you know, they're now celebrities in the book, you know, because they're featured. Oh, they're not happy about that I, I, because I, I'm inclined to tell the truth about them, so they don't, they don't necessarily like it. But I, you know, your prologue, and that that goes to the serious nature of things, because, and sort of the extraordinary nature of your birth and where you went. You you talk about your pro prologue starts by I was born to be someone else. Someone, that is, whose life is defined principally by race, segregation, and poverty. Can you speak to that? Well, I, at the time, I was born in 1945, and at the time I was growing up, a black person in the South under Jim Crow, prior to civil rights, was expected to be fundamentally nothing. Um, subservient, to be sure, um, a worker to help the economy, uh, but in no sense someone who should have aspirations. In no sense. In fact, it could be very dangerous to have aspirations because you had to stay in your place. And you dared not voice ambition because that was tantamount to violating the rules of the day. That's why it's so important for students today to assert their right 
to ambition uh, because it was denied your forebears. Um, so I was thought when I was, bo was, I was growing up that I would not really do very much in my life, that I would um, uh, maybe uh, find employment, uh, maybe, um, if I, uh, um, on the more aspirational side, I thought perhaps I might work in a business or something. Um, on the realistic side, I thought I would probably work as a maid. And so my world, uh, when I started out, was, was that. I'm limited because of who I am, a woman, black, poor, and that can take me nowhere. And then this miraculous thing happened, and that is people stepped onto my path who said, no, 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 you can do more than that. And that's the consequence of school and of teachers and of other people encouraging me to think differently about what my life could be. Yeah, I want to uh, just take you back a little bit, though, to your 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 parents um, and their family background. Um, and I'd like to start with your father. Um, his name was Isaac Ike Henry Stubblefield, and uh, you describe him as a short man um, with his own contradictions and a temper. But can you can you talk about him? Well, he, he was, uh, in many ways, um, very typical of what you would call the Napoleon complex. Um, and that, it, that is, uh, he, he was pretty short. And it must have been terrifying for my father because almost all of his sons towered over him. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so that was kind of mystifying to me. But my father was very much of his time. If you think about what my life was like and how limited it was, think about what my parents' lives would have been before then. Uh, and my, my father had a very harsh um, youth. Uh, he suffered greatly, he and his uh, brothers, um, and lived on the cusp of perennial need, basically. Uh, and that, I think, uh, conditioned him to be the person he was. Uh, and the person he was is that he wanted all things for himself. Um, and when my mother would prepare food, uh, he was the first to eat, and he had to have the choice um, uh, elements of a meal. Um, he was the um, mo he cared a lot about his appearance, and so he cared a great way uh, about maintaining himself and. Um, and looking and looking good, uh, but as I often say, with with no care to how my mother looked uh, or how we looked. So he was he was very very um, interested in himself, I would say, um, but he could be wonderful and and generous at the same time. And I was very spoiled as a child. And so, as my sisters tell me repeatedly, I was spoiled by him in particular. Uh, but he could, be, he, could be, he could be generous, but we didn't see enough of that um, as one might today. Um, he lived under the burden of having been uh, discriminated against all of his life virtually. Uh, and that's what we saw in him. Like a lot of black men. But you know, the other thing is that he, as I remember you talking in the book, his, his mother had abandoned him, right? Yes. And so that may have been some of the reason for yes. the, the self-focus. But all, all his brothers, they, they were around, right? And very close. Very close. Uh, close families were often really saved people um, in those days. Now, my, my, uh, my father's uh, mother, um, and, I, you know, I don't, I have, you have to remember in those days, women had few choices. So um, her husband died, she uh, remarried, uh, and then I think you know um, that was not a happy circumstance for her new husband to have these boys. And so she put them out of the house and they had to fend for themselves uh, when they were 10 and under. They lived alone, they, they foraged for food, um, and and to, so what could make them closer than that? But they were bound together, uh, and it was a wonderful thing to see them 
uh, as they were older because they, uh, they enjoyed each other's company, they supported each other to the hilt and so forth, much as my sis sisters and brothers do today um, with, with me. So families could be very strong in those days because what else did you have? Well, um, well, you had to rely on family, and in many ways, what you're talking about and what we, you know, need to learn more about is that black people had to make a, a way out of no way. Of course. Under bad of circumstances. Of course, yes, and they did, mm -hmm. and they did. So what about your mother? What about her, her name and her side of the family? Um, well, Mama was um, extraordinary um, to me because um, she too had had um, a harsh enough life. Uh, her um, father died uh, young. She was raised by, uh, principally by, by her mother, um, who was an extraordinary woman in her own right. Um, uh, but uh, she married my father at a, at a young age, and then she had a lot of children. Um, but she was completely dominated by my father and what he wanted in everything, um, which meant that she had no agency herself. Um, and, and so she um, served him. Um, she was, you know, the classic help me. Um, she served him. Uh, she scurried about when he, wanted, uh, when he wanted something. So here she is taking care of her husband, and then she's taking care of all of these children, 12 children, my goodness. I mean, I only have two. And honestly, I, you know, <laughs> Sorry to think. And, and, you know, my, my niece, uh, uh, Danielle, has one, and she can barely make it with one. <laughs> um, and, yeah, where's Trey? <laughs> yeah, uh, and th that's the one right there. <laughs> But imagine 12 children, imagine 12 children. And so you've got 12 children, you've got the burden of this household. You've got to go to the field and work like a field hand. You have to come home and you have to prepare meals and keep the house clean and do all of that. And yet she was the most uplifting person you've ever met. She was kind, she was generous, she um, taught us things that one dare not believe uh, a person with that background would teach. And what was that? Don't think too much of yourself. Don't hold yourself above others. Um, the, the kindness of this woman was something I've been trying to work up to all my life and failing at, of course, because it was so exemplary. But, but um, you know, people ask me all the time about leadership and what made a difference for me, and I always say it was my mother because she taught me the most important thing about leadership. And the important thing about leadership is respecting other people. It's respecting other right. people. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, being concerned about others. And the story I tell in the book is, you know, the thing about my mother that was very frustrating for me when I was young is that people would come to our house and we had practically nothing. And she would offer to give people everything we had. Okay? <laughs> it was very, very upsetting. And when we would go to other people's houses, she would forbid us to accept anything offered us because she said they might need it. <laughs> really? Well, well, and there are 12 of you. And, and there are 12 of us. And, and there's food is and not in there's never enough. enough food. Exactly, never exactly. Enough food. But, but anyway, but she was just that uh, generous a person. And that her, her dream was, you know, she wanted to live a, a good life, a godly life. She was very religious. And most of all, she wanted to live long enough for us to be grown. And she almost made it. Uh, I was 15 when she died. But she had been ill for a very long time, and I didn't know that when I was um, a, a, a preteen and a teenager. Um, and, then, um, and then she was suffering. She was doing all these things. 
and she was suffering to boot. How do you live up to that kind of model? Uh, you, you can't, you can't. But you can feel inspired by it, and I definitely do. Describe the house, though. I think, I think it's important for the, I mean, you had, many, you had different homes that you went to in different places. Well, Brooklyn. rudimentary. Right, so talk, talk yeah, about I mean, it, because uh, I want everyone to, well, to course, envision at, the house. At, at, at that time, of course, uh, in, in Grapeland, I mean, we had, we had um, no running water, uh, we had uh, no electricity, um, we had, um, you know, uh, none of the modern conveniences, basically. When we got to Houston, we improved on that because we, we had um, running water and we had an inside uh, toilet and all of that. Um, uh, but our houses were small uh, and um, they were basic. Uh, and it's sort of interesting because I was back in the neighborhood um, last Monday and walking around, I could see, well, there's, there's, these houses are the same in Fifth Ward. I grew up in Fifth Ward. Um, and they're much the same. Um, small row houses in many instances uh, is what we basically um, lived in. Uh, front room, uh, and then uh, maybe a small uh, eating area, and then a kitchen, and then two bedrooms. Uh, one in the back uh, for, uh, for children, uh, in this case, girls, um, and uh, one in the front for my parents, and one bathroom between the two. Um, but, you know, basically, uh, uh, you know, I think about that today, and we, we most of us have more than we need. You do. That's right. Um, and so we think that we need all of this paraphernalia and all of these lavish things, and we don't at all, right? Um, and so we become accustomed to all of the extras. And the more we have those extras, the less we appreciate what it takes really to produce them. And so we are just consuming things like mad um, and the condition of the earth is getting worse and worse because we are, we are consuming like mad and, uh, and we've got to cut that out because we won't have anything left for our grandchildren if we don't. That's right. You know, you, um, and that's, and I would say just seeing the family intact the way it is, um, that says a lot about, you know, the family, which a lot of times we're, we're dealing with how to keep that family together. Yes. You know? Well, we fight a lot, um, but, you know, we're still together. Well, families always yeah, fight yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> or most families, I won't say. But, you know, when you moved, um, I, moving to Houston was a defining moment really for yeah, you yeah. Um, and it's 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 111 miles away from where you were there, you know, there was a, a, a town between um, Daly and, um, and and Houston right that you lots stayed. of them lots yeah. of them because you would pocket be uh, love lady um, of course Huntsville you have to go through Huntsville uh, and so on to get to Houston so why why all those moves uh, well, we only moved from Daly. Uh, at, well, we moved to Lake Texo. Uh, uh, and in those days, you went where the work was. Um, the, you didn't have flexibility, you know. Uh, uh, and so we moved to Lake, Lake Texo because my father um, uh, worked for someone who uh, provided um, a residence for us in Lake Texo. So we moved there. Uh, and then from La Texo, we moved to Houston. And, and I, as I was saying, Houston, even in Houston, you're at 45, 13 Lee Street, Sam Wilson Street, Liberty Street, 43, 32 Sumter Street. And what is the Houston that you come into? Wow. Um, well, Houston in those days was, you know, pretty brash, um, uh, still uh, full, of, full of itself. But... Uh, but deeply segregated, deeply segregated. And so the Houston I remember from uh, those days was a continuation um, of the life that we had in Grapeland because there, were, there was a long list of things that you could not do 
there was a long list of things you dared not do, right? And so um, I think there was a time when you couldn't go uh, to a department store and try on clothes. Because I mean, who's gonna try on something that a black person has tried on before, right? Um, and we couldn't go to restaurants. Um, so all of the things that young people today are so accustomed to, I mean, they just get up and go wherever they wanna go, right? Uh, but we knew that uh, most of those things were forbidden to us. We had to stay in our place, even though it was a city. Uh, and that place, though, was bigger. And so Fifth Ward uh, afforded us the opportunity to have theaters, um, to have uh, doctors, um, dentists, churches, and so forth. So it was a whole community um, that was bigger uh, uh, and ampler, but still deeply segregated. Now, what are you, you're, you're at this point, you're a, a teenager. Who's raising you up at this point? You know, because you even talk about being embarrassed about your mother. Well, I mean, I was embarrassed about my mother because when we came to the city, I was embarrassed about everything when right. I, we came to the Teenagers city. Teenagers yeah. often are. We right? are, well, well, that was really before I became a teenager, but, but you, you have to see, you know, when you come from the country, I mean, you really, well, you saw that picture up there. Uh, <laughs> You know, you've got plaits sticking up all over your head, um, and you're, you know, talking in a certain way, and you maybe have two dresses um, to wear, um, and so forth, and you're where people are looking at you and laughing at you, and, you know, knowing that you're country, and so forth. So, um, so anybody who comes into a different uh, culture and a different place uh, sometimes has to make that uh, adjustment. So, you know, feeling that um, uh, was really what my life was like. And so if I was um, kind of ridiculed, uh, my mother, who was still struggling as she came to the city, um, wearing dresses that, you know, were kind of shapeless, not, not going to get her hair done. And I saw all these women in Houston who went to the beauty parlor and had their hair done, and they wore makeup. Um, and my mother, uh, my father would never permit her to wear makeup, right? And so she was very plain, and her hair was kind of, I don't know. And so I was kind of, yeah, I mean, um, but I was, I was just I was embarrassed about all of it. I was embarrassed to be poor. I was embarrassed um, to be country. I was embarrassed that I didn't have clothes. I mean, that was that was pretty much my my whole being <laughs> at that point. Um, but I, I grew older uh, and, um, and kind of adapted more, more or less to, uh, to the city, but, um, but it was, you know, it was hard. But I, th you're talking about identity and identity formation, which is, yeah. you know, which is, is hard. So I'm wondering, where are you finding yourself? Are you finding yourself in church or are you finding yourself in school? I would say my, path uh, to self-knowledge was long, um, and um, I began defining myself, in a sense, after my mother died. And here's the thing, this woman that I thought was, you know, not really suited for the city became my model because of all of her teachings and because of the person she was. And suddenly I began to understand the kind of core that I needed to have, uh, the things that I needed to value, uh, the judgment that I needed to bring to bear. I started putting that together uh, as, you know, in my high school years, uh, and then mostly in college. By the time I got to college, um, I, was, I was almost there. I was quite insufferable uh, when I was in college. Um, I was uh, outspoken, uh, I was uh, a constant uh, critic of the uh, college that I, where I was, um, I was an activist, um, and they finally came up, up with a way to get rid of me, and they sent me away for a year uh, when I was in college because I was so awful, but, uh, but, but. Wait a minute, wait a minute, go on. Yeah. They, I mean, they 
they sent you away, but that, that year was really pretty extraordinary. Well, right? the year was beneficial, but I'm, they didn't care if it was beneficial. <laughs> they, just, they just wanted me gone. Because, you were a troublemaker. Because right? I was a troublemaker. <laughs> uh, you know, because here's the thing about those college years. Everything that I am today in terms of what I stand for was formed when I was in college because I fought for things when I was in college. I learned how to do that. I learned to suffer the consequences of that. When I was getting ready to graduate from college, my, uh, my college uh, wrote to my family and said, Ruth will not be graduating uh, because uh, she failed to complete the chapel requirement. Because I protested chapel. What else, <laughs> what else could I do? Because I said in my 17-year-old thought process, you mean to tell me that you're going to make students of every faith go to a Protestant service and require that to graduate? That seemed totally unjust to me, and said, I will not go. Um, and of course, there were only Protestants there. <laughs> but it didn't matter. It was the principle of the thing, right? <laughs> and so, so uh, <laughs> they were not happy with me at all. Um, and so they were going to get me back by not allowing me to graduate. But here's the problem. I worked very hard in college. And when I was a senior, I started applying for things. I applied for um, a Fulbright. I applied for a Danforth Fellowship. I applied for graduate schools. And doggone it, I got into all of them. And the problem is, if I did not graduate, they couldn't say that they had a student uh, who had received a Fulbright, who had received a Danforth, and who had gotten into Harvard. <laughs> That's a, they changed their minds. <laughs> so keep in mind, OK, you can be outspoken. That's fine. But you sure better be doing your work, OK? And you, That's uh, because, right. Because you have to have the means to stand behind what you're doing. You have to. Um, otherwise, uh, keep your mouth shut. Yeah. You know, um, I'd like to just go back a little bit to your, the people who influenced you in high school, um, because school was an outlet for you. Um, and it's probably where you um, found that you really could, you know, excel. So, I, you know, there's Miss Ida May, Miss Bird, Miss Smith, Mr. Saunders, Mrs. Carraway, Miss Lilly, your niece Alma, who you were, you know, Always competing with. Competing with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, teachers. Teachers. Everything. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, affiliated with nonprofit groups trying to help the teaching profession because between um, those groups' children who are most marginalized and most in need, and a future. That public school teacher stands in between and makes it possible for those children to get out of poverty, to find a way uh, to a, a good future. There's nothing more important than teaching, in my view. Um, and so I had the benefit of having people like that um, take an interest in me and helping me. But they were doing it for everybody. Um, but I um, benefited from it, uh, and that's why I've been able to do what I've done. Yeah. Now, you, um, you wanted a career on, in theater. Yes. Right. I yeah. mean, that's where you thought you were going to be. I wanted to be an actress. Right. <laughs> and and you're, you're, but when you got to Dillard, yeah. you, you, were, sh you were told that, act, I mean, acting. No, I was wasn't actually told. <laughs> I just, I just, I didn't know what acting was. Um, and I guess I had been doing uh, acting at the high school level. When I got to college, they started talking about things like motivation and uh, 
Stanislavski method, right? Yeah, St <laughs> St Stanislavski and more. And then one day in class, you know, they said, okay, now, Ruth, I want you to be a chair. <laughs> and you go. I, I, that did it for me. I mean, how am I going to be a chair? How am I going to be a cauliflower? Um, but this is the kind of thing. Is, is, is Teresa here? I don't know. I don't know what you people are doing in theater uh, when you try to make uh, actors come out of themselves and be objects uh, and so forth. Uh, I, I'm sure it's, it works, but it didn't work for me. Uh, so I dropped out of theater. And you were, you know, you were embarrassed to tell Miss Zoe, who, who was your theater. I know. I, I, was, I, I was embarrassed to tell her, yeah, because, uh, because she was principally responsible for me going to college. And she sent me to Dillard because she said white colleges were not ready for me. Um, and so she sent me to, uh, I think she was probably right. Uh, she sent me to this black college to be a theater major because she thought I could get roles and that I would, you know, I would, uh, my career would be uh, fostered well uh, in, a, in a black college. But, you know, in those days, black colleges were not, you know, they, are, they, they were imitations of white colleges, basically. That's all they were. There was no sense of the history of African American people and what you could uniquely do in um, an, an HBCU, it, that was missing. You they, should you should emphasize that because people don't necessarily know that that there were very it was very yeah. European and it's focused well, very it, yeah. up to one hundred percent. So if you took music, um, you studied classical uh, European works. You better not mention jazz or or any <laughs> African American music because you would fail the course, right? Um, there was no teaching of African American studies. That was not legitimate, okay? And so what, you, what did you study? You studied these, these distant realms, these literatures and so forth, uh, that had nothing ostensibly to do with you. And so they, on the one hand, helped you understand that you were worth something, but they didn't do the follow-up, which is to say, not only are you worth something, but your forebears did this, and they accomplished that, and this is what holds you high um, as you go forward. They, they didn't do any of that. Um, that isn't completely gone. Uh, when I went, uh, when I sent my son off to Morehouse, um, he almost dropped out because he was a music major and they wouldn't teach jazz at Morehouse. So, um, so HBCUs have to come on with it, as far as I'm concerned, okay? Uh, it is time to step into, it's, it's time to step into this space and own it. Uh, and the thing that really, as I, I started to learn more and more, so I'm going to these white universities, and what are they doing? They're extolling African-American studies, right? Right. Uh, and they're talking about Africa. I'm thinking, well, wait, wait. So your students have the benefit of that. But if you go to um, a black college, they are not doing that. And I think some of that has to do with the, um, the system that colleges are in uh, and the kinds of things that are, uh, the kinds of things are, that, are, that are forbidden. And that is why, if you're gonna be an HBCU, you better learn to fight that. Um, because if you don't, you will be a distant version of um, the real thing, so to speak. So what is it that we can be in, in, in ourselves? That's what, that's, what, uh, that's what I always ponder. What can we be? What can we be? So as I mentioned, I'm doing this um, thing um, in, uh, later this month where I'm bringing... Um, uh, presidents of HBCUs uh, to Harvard. And we are, and we are talking about the, um, how to make uh, HBCUs uh, stronger uh, and how to make them part of the 
a community of universities because you know they have been shunned for a long, long time. And the president, the new president of Harvard, who is African American, um, is going to have lunch with them, and we're going to begin a process of working uh, with HBCUs to give them the ballast that they need. Because if you're in a system and you're by yourself, you don't have much power. But if you have the if you have the country with you, you're in a much stronger place. Much stronger place. You know, I um, you know, I I I like jumped at the opportunity to sit down with you because Ruth, you are one of the most brilliant and forward change agents that we have in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm sure it is. And, and I would bet on you a thousand percent for anything that you take on. You. And um, I, I want to make sure my family heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say Wait. that again. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, because um, they're always telling me I'm not all that. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're just trying to keep you. They're trying to keep you grounded. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're the youngest. Remember, oh, you were spoiled. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I, I um. Because there's a lot of growth that we have where, you know, you, um, this takes me to, there have been so many things and we're not going to have all the time to talk about all the things that you have done uh, for us um, from an education standpoint as a community. Um, and maybe, you know, and even the book, I mean, the book really ends here at college, you know, and the transformative things about college. because. College changed your life. It did. In one year, that year that you got, you were, ex well, you were given an opportunity but right. sort of sent away. That year, talk about that year because you do, I mean, it's a transformative year. Well, what I always say to my students is, um, I, I'll try to always remember to say this, don't presume that you know what every encounter, every person, every opportunity is going to afford you. You will never know that. And so some of the things that I thought were not very important turned out to be the most important things in my life. Some of the things that I thought would be glorious uh, turned out not to be. Some of the people that I thought were not going to be very important were the most important to me in the end. Some of the people who criticized me most turned out to be my strongest supporters. So I try to have an open attitude so that I am awake to the possibility that everything that occurs could just be the most important thing that ever happens to me. And if students do that, um, then they're not, they, you know, when they encounter someone who is sweeping the floor, they're not gonna walk past them. They're going to see them as somebody who could be important in their lives, you know. Uh, and the, one of the things that I do, I do, uh, you know, it's it is a it's a regimen in a way. Um, you know, I drive. I'm now at Rice, and I drive to Rice. And I there's one route that I take every day when I go to Rice. Um, and I go down Fannin Street past the soup kitchen. Um, and um, it's a long way, but I do it so that I can see the people there who are living on the street, who have no means at their disposal, because I'm driving to a rich place where people have everything that they need at their disposal, and I never want to forget, ever, the way the world really is. <laughs> Because if you forget that, you'll forget what you can do and what you have an obligation to do in the world. And what that year did for me is it gave me a sense of what I could do in the world. There are two things that happened to me in that year. The first was this place had a woman president. A Wellesley. I was, a Wellesley. I, I was shocked. I was shocked coming out of a very paternalistic background. Uh, and my father, who was so severe, we couldn't, we couldn't wear um, uh, 
pants. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't do anything when I was growing up uh, because women had a certain place and had to behave a certain way, period. And here was this woman running a whole, a whole college. That struck me as something that I needed to pay attention to. The second thing that happened to me is I got in a course and I was completely over my head. Uh, I was lost and I thought, this is the moment when I need to drop out of college. And so I, um, it was a French course uh, and I went to the professor um, and said, uh, I'm very sorry, I'm going to have to drop this course because I'm completely lost. Uh, I don't understand anything that's being said or done in this class. And he said, to my horror, ne vous inquiétez pas, mademoiselle. Don't worry. Don't worry. I said, but what am I to do? I'm lost. He said, just work harder. <laughs> I was convinced that he was a racist, um, <laughs> that, uh, that he was an uncaring, selfish uh, foreigner. Um, I, I thought all of those things uh, when this man looked at me and said, go back and work harder. And if I had had the money, honestly, I would, have, I would have left college. I would have, but I didn't have the money to leave. Um, and so I did what I, only thing I could do, and I, I started going to the language laboratory and working harder. And then one day I'm sitting in class and I'm startled because I'm understanding everything that's being said. I'm thinking, how did that happen? That moment of recognition changed my, the trajectory of my life because I had been, whatever I was doing, I had been afraid my whole life. Afraid imposter maybe um, because, you know, what if I can't do this? What if I can't do that? And, and, you know, am I good enough? That day in that class, I lost forever my fear. Um, and from that day on, I was never afraid to take anything on. Never. I was never afraid to go anywhere. Uh, I was never afraid to assert what I thought um, because of that man telling me, you can do it, just go and work harder. So, you know, I tell my students, stay away from those professors who are telling you how wonderful you are, okay? You don't need that. Look for the ones who tell you what you need to know. Look for the criticism that helps you grow. And that's how, that's how you know. So, you know, most of the time, um, uh, I, you know, I, I learned that day that I could do something that was difficult. And I could do it in the face of skepticism. Uh, and there's nothing more empowering than that. Digging deeply, doing the work, overcoming something, that shapes you forever. And that year was, I mean, you started that year in Mexico. You went to Wellesley, yeah. you know, which was an all-white institution. And then, to and then to France. I mean, it yeah. was like... Well, I was on a tear. Um, I knew something was wrong with this country. I knew it because... It was, it was hateful, it was discriminatory, it was racist, and I was in the prison here. Um, and I thought, I need to learn for myself what is beyond the borders of my country. Because I need to know whether the whole world is like this. Um, and so I got on a Greyhound bus when I was 17 years old by myself. I don't think I told my family what I was doing. Um, and I went to Mexico to live with a Mexican family. Um, and then um, <laughs> I, you know, the, the, I went to France for the summer. Um, so I was on a quest to see what is going on and how did we end up being such a divided society? And why are people the way that they are? I wanted, I, I had to answer that for myself because um, you know, I always say I learned to love, love my country by leaving it. Um, I learned about this country 
by leaving it, by learning about other cultures and, and histories. And it, it was, again, a very empowering experience to know that we are this way for a reason, okay? We are this way, not because it is mandated that as human beings we be this way. We are this way because of the um, history um, of the way this country uh, came into being. But the other thing that I understood is we don't have to be this way forever, okay? And so my task was to start figuring out what I could do to help bring about the change needed to make this country better. Yeah. And you've done, you've done a lot, really, in that regard. And I mean, I think about this, like the time that you know, you're born in, the place you're born in, the way we are now in society, that we're struggling. We can look out on this audience. Lots of people are worried about what the future is going to be. And, and that takes me back to chapter one of your book, where you start with crossroads. You state, I was born at a crossroads, a crossroads in history, a crossroads in culture, and geographical crossroads. We here, now in society, we have political, societal, environmental, our nation's reckoning with its enslaved past, which you started, you name it. How can your life really provide an answer to our present and future issues here in the United States? Well, I wouldn't be so bold as, as to say that. I mean, I but I will say um, that uh, I believe it's everybody's duty to play a role in making this country what it should be. Everybody's duty. Um, and, um, and how do we do that? Uh, we, we don't have to be grandiose. I never started off with any grandiose plans. I, I started off with very modest plans. I wanted to simply do something a little better. When I took on slavery, um, it wasn't a grandiose thing at all. Mm -hmm. People want to make it a big thing today, Huge. but it wasn't. It, when I did it, because I was, wanted to do one thing, one thing, and that is I just wanted to tell the truth about slavery um, and what its role had been um, at, uh, at the university. That's all I wanted to do. Um, and I simply said, I will not lie. I will not, because when I went to the books to see uh, what was said about slavery, it was totally eradicated, right? There's no mention of slavery. Um, and yet, in our archives, we had the log books of slave chi ships um, that, was, uh, that were owned by our founder. Um, and it was, it was written throughout our history that we had benefited greatly from the slave trade. Uh, and we needed to tell the truth about that. So Ruth, I started, th that was modest. But Ruth, that, that, that may have been modest, but it opened up. One, this country has not had. Uh, it cannot, it has struggled to deal with its enslaved past. We still are struggling. The other thing is that it opened up the fact that slavery was as much a northern tradition as it was a yes. southern tradition. Yes. And it led a lot of universities looking at their, their involvement in yep. their enslaved past. Over, over 100 now have done it. So it's, and that's, that's gratifying. But I, that's not the end. I want, I want to, um, I want to ask you, um, because you came, you came, um, um, you could have stayed out east where you're celebrated, and you came back. Why did you come back? Be because it's home. I came home. And home is where the heart is, right? Well, I, well first of all, you know, when I was uh, in, in the Northeast, uh, you know, people pick on Texas. Uh, quite a lot. And when I was named president of Brown, um, you know, there were whispers of, oh my God, somebody from Texas is going to be president of, of Brown? That was number one. And number two was, oh my God, she's a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, the, the New Englanders have their biases. Uh, and so I was really dead in the sphere of, you know, something that might really be awful for Brown. 
And so, um, so but, but for me, um, this has always been a place that is worthy of the work that we need to do for it, okay? My family um, were very disconcerted all those years that I was in the East because they, they thought I was such a failure because um, they would say to me, can't you find a job in Texas? <laughs> And uh, so when I finally got a job at Prairie View, it was like, oh my God, I finally had done something. You know, <laughs> because, the, yeah. Yay, yeah, yeah. Prairie View, yay! <laughs> because, you know, when you're, when you're a dot in the wool Texan, that's the way you feel. You know, it's, all, it's, it's here. And people, when I go back east, they say, how are you, how do you live there? And with the policies and so forth, and they start, you know? Uh, and so on, but um, this is a place to be because there's so much good work to do. There's so much good work to do. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm, you know, when I started at Prairie View, I said, the first day I started, I am all in. And I'm back here and I'm all in for whatever I need to do in order to advance um, uh, this place. And look what you did. I mean, what you did was phenomenal. Thank you. I mean, we still got, we got others to work on. They should follow in your footsteps. There are lots of us that should follow in your footsteps because at the beginning and end of the day, education for black people began, started at HBCU. Yeah. So we have to understand yeah. that it's important. So I wanna say, to, um, to you, Dr. Ruth Jean Stubblefield Sim Simmons, I want to thank you for coming home, for a life of education, leadership, and groundbreaking breaking change. I want to thank you for your hard work and determination on how far your life's journey has taken you. But you literally never forgot where you came from. And I want to thank you for being a role model for all of us and I want to encourage literally everybody here in this audience, you go right by that book because it is life changing, page turning. I found myself like going through it and looking and I'm going to read it again and again. I want to thank you for being who you are and, and for this stage in your journey and your dedication to our community at a time that we need it so badly. Thank, Thank, you you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to say? Did you want to say anything else? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, please let us give a, a round of applause for this amazing conversation we just participated in and witnessed. to move into a brief Q&A opportunity for you all to engage um, our esteemed uh, uh, guests this afternoon. Um, I just want to start off with a first question right quick. Um, in preparing for this amazing day, um, I've been listening to the book on Audible, and it has been like story time <laughs> with Ruth J. Simmons. So if you haven't picked up the book, first of all, do pick up the book, read along with her as she conveys her life story. But I, I would actually recommend you allowing Ruth to tell the story to you in your ear. Um, I've spent the last oh, week nice. with my grandkids listening to you, in particular, little Emma, uh, who is a huge <laughs> fan of yours. And um, one thing about the book that stands out to me, and it's, it's important that this is a part of the Toni Morrison Writing Center, or writing program, is that when we get autobiographies from esteemed people, leaders of varying sorts, the, the book tends to feel like nonfiction documentary in a book. However, yours has the feel of poetic prose like Toni Morrison's work, or picturesque detailing like Alice Walker's work, 
it is unrelenting in the painting that you do of what Grapeland and, and later Houston means to you. How did those writers, how did those, those women impact your life throughout your career as an educator as well as an artist that led you to the way you told the story of home? Well, I guess, um, you know, what everybody has to wrestle with um, is revealing that most private part of yourself, your, your doubts, your failures, um, your unworthy thoughts. Um, and uh, it's, it's very difficult um, to think of how to do that. Uh, when you know that people are going to have access to that and you're no longer the same person because now, um, now people are aware of the kinds of things that you have, that you've been through and so forth. So um, I remember um, Toni Morrison was a dear friend of mine and she, um, her house burned down one Christmas and she had, it, had to have it rebuilt and so she had rented a house in Sneedon's Landing just outside of New York. And um, when her house was rebuilt, she moved back into her house, but she still had some time left on her lease. And so I decided to rent her house for the summer. And I think I thought, foolish me, that I, that would give me some inspiration for writing. And so I actually sat at her desk uh, and watched the tea roses climbing up the window and so forth. And I didn't write a thing. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I, so it's not, as much as I admire our great writers, um, I didn't draw inspiration from them for this book. Um, but instead, I drew inspiration from my mother, um, to be honest, uh, to be true, uh, to tell the truth of who I am. That's, that's what motivated me. Sure. When you talk about walking barefoot through the grass of the land, you talk about the wagon that you all had to take going from home into, into town, um, I think you underestimate the poetic power you have and the detailing of that. <laughs> Hopefully this has give, given our students time to go around and meet with folks who have questions. Um, let's see, who has the first question yeah, out in the audience? Here. How do? So, there, there he is. He's coming down with the microphone. It's on. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Hi. 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 My name is Mimi. I've been here at Prairie View since 2019, and it's an amazing honor to meet you. I've been to the Marshall Storm. I've been in um, honors programs. I've been to nursing school. Aww. Came back, and I decided. I'm gonna change my whole life and I'm going into psychology. So I've literally been here for just watching, honestly. And my biggest question is how do you, coming from a background of like a father not really giving you the time and kind of being selfish, how do you not be selfish but also assert yourself? Because I feel like I have a problem with asserting myself and knowing that there are needs of others, but I'm not assertive enough to push past my fears to be able to help others other than just myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do you wow. get away from that? Wow. wow. Um, I, I think it is principally uh, through your deeds that you come to have the confidence that you need to do other things because it's like a ladder. You do this little thing here and that's okay. And then you do the next thing, and then the next thing. And what you're building uh, is your self-esteem because of what you're doing. You're building know-how because of what you're doing. And you're building ultimately the confidence uh, to fail because when you are reluctant to assert yourself, you really, that's about fear that you might fail. But um, you need to lose that by uh, um, having a, a body of accomplishments that tell you, it's okay if I fail because I've done all these things, okay? And remember, 
the accomplishments can be infinitesimal, really. Um, they don't have to be big. They don't have to be big. Um, uh, it might be that one day you see another student who needs help and you help them. It might be you see somebody who is in the grocery store and um, they clearly don't have enough money. And you might decide to put down your groceries and give them everything you have so they will be able to do that. You know, um, There are myriad ways to build that self-confidence because you, have, you will have stored in your memory all the wonderful things that, that you've done. Um, and that gives you the ballast that you need to step out there and to say, this is what I think. And I think that's what helps me do it because, you know, uh, over time, I think the little things that I have done help me understand that I'm worthy enough to offer my opinion, that I'm worthy enough to try something that nobody has tried before, that I'm worthy enough to fail. Um, just keep doing things. Excellent. You have a question here? <laughs> Oh. Hi, Dr. Simmons. Hi. Uh, I'm Dr. Robin Trailer. I'm a 2000 graduate from Prairie View A&M University. I just happen to have my own Ruth the Truth. Um, <laughs> Ruth Franklin is my mother. She graduated Prairie View okay. in uh, 1969. I'm going to start with um, gratitude. Um, my family is from Houston County, and my whole life you've been an absolute rock star. I remember reading about you back in the 80s and in the 90s. And part of the reason that I knew that I could make it, you know, beyond Houston County or wherever in life is because you had already done it. Um, and uh, people from my generation um, found inspiration in stories like yours. Um, there are others who were able to come out of Houston County and go, you know, far, far, you know, in this world. Um, and I find that uh, once we kind of reach peak of our careers or toward end of our careers, there, there is that draw um, back to rural Texas. And I, so here's the question, is your family still in Houston County? Um, do you, are, are, is, there any, is there any work um, being done up home, you know, in Houston County? Um, or is, is there any connection for you still uh, to that part of Texas? Thank you. Um, well, uh, first of all, I, I own my grandmother's land um, uh, still, uh, I, I won't. Uh, I won't let go of it. I had, I right. innocently thought at some point I would have a house there um, and go back. But my life is such that um, that that is a pipe dream. I just don't have the time uh, to do it. We have family still there, um, and we go uh, back whenever uh, whenever we can. My brother, who is here with me today, uh, is a minister, and he goes up there to preach uh, homecoming um, uh, at our uh -huh. church um, there. Uh, and whenever we, uh, why don't you the stand, uh, Arnold, so people can see you. Um, uh, and so, so we have very deep connections. And you know, it's often true that you're not really sure how your home is going to feel about you based on what you've done. And, um, and so, you know, as I say, I, I've been pretty outspoken across the span of my uh, career, so I'm aware that I might not be everybody's cup of tea. But here's what happened to me last year. I got invited back to Grapeland to be the Grand Marshal of the Peanut Festival. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have imagined that at one time? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who would have imagined that? We have time for one more question. There, uh, oh, there, there are two three. more questions. Well, one oh, here and then here, and then we'll bring Dr. Thomas Smith back. Okay. My name is Karen Stafford Tisdale, and I am a product of Prairie View. Uh, these browns mean a lot to us, to our family. My sister is up there. So 
But our aunt graduated in 1915. Our grandmother wow. graduated in 1921. And I graduated in 79 and 80. <laughs> I, 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 your, I think I've cried the whole time you've been up there. So, because Aww. your history is our history. That's right. That's right. And my question is, where do we go from here? Because of the rich history of, of Prairie View and home, right. this is home That's right. for me. How do we instill in these young people the importance of the richness of what you're talking about and what we're talking about? Where do we go from here, from this point on, in order to instill in them the very same things that you're, you've instilled in us? You have been an inspiration because you brought forth, you actually raised some sleeping giants. Well, we also had an uncle that was murdered in the Tulsa massacre. Oh, God. And, and so oh. that history, along with what, because our grandmother graduated in 1921, and she found out the news about her brother being murdered in that massacre, and I had a chance to go and visit 100 years when they celebrated 100 to actually touch the walls and see where he was murdered. But how do you instill in the young people how important it is that they know that? That's why, that's, that's why the curriculum here is so very important, okay? Um, here's the thing to know. Why is it that we've resurrected the idea that one cannot speak of race? Why is it that we are banning right. books right. Um, so that uh, young people cannot have access to certain books? Um, um, there is reason for that. Um, without knowledge, without that connection, uh, you are not um, a threat, okay? And so the will to suppress uh, your sense of pride, your sense of connection to who you are, that's a powerful force uh, among people who really do not want you ever to consider yourself equal. Um, that's a powerful force. You must understand it as so, because if you don't understand it as so, you'll be mowed over constantly by the will of other people who want to suppress you. Um, and so our students need to understand what is at issue. What is at issue is you are connected to a powerful tradition and it falls to you in your time to preserve and enhance that tradition. Now, you know, I am one who advocates very broadly for openness to everybody, okay? Um, and the one thing I uh, very much, um, uh, very much hate is any idea of racial bias at all. Um, at the same time, we are stronger as a country if we're all strong severally, independently. And that is, in order for us to be as strong as we need to be, um, there are certain things you all have to do. You have to pay attention. You have to be awake all the time to what's going on around you, all the time. So when a and came to me and said, you have to stop being president, although you can continue to be president, but you can't make any decisions anymore, okay? Uh, you have to be awake to say, well, then I won't stay. You have to be awake. Because every time, every time you roll over in the face of that, everybody around you is hurt by it. That's right because the next time will be even worse than that. That's right. So That's we right. fight for something um, very important. Um, we fight for something very important, okay? We, are, we want to be um, uh, a member in full of the human race. Right. And that means we must have our dignity. 
We must have our freedom. We must have our independence. If we don't have those things, we cannot be a member in full of the human race. And so Prairie View is so dear, everybody associated with this institution should be going to bat for it all the time. That means giving money to it. That means defending it when it needs to be defended. That means enhancing it in whatever way it can be enhanced. Uh, because whether or not Prairie View is better today or tomorrow than it has been in the past will rest on all of you. And if you are not doing your job, okay, then it won't be for sure. Okay, so, so that's the thing. Um, do whatever you can for Prairie View. We have a question here in the middle, in the third row. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, if we can, if we can meet her with the microphone. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm an educator. Uh, I'm also an actress, a musician. My grandmother graduated from Prairie View in 1911. I have her diploma. Wow. My parents graduated from Prairie View in 1951. I was here with my grandparents to honor them. But as an educator, and having been at the Galveston Children's Museum on Saturday of last week to teach them about Juneteenth, how could I not talk about slavery? And so I made these storyboards with pictures on them to spark the children's interest to let them ask me, what story, what picture do you want me to talk about? One white child wanted to talk about the picture of the Ku Klux Klan. And then early in my presentation, which it is my role to teach everybody I meet, the building of Texas economic development from cotton and sugar. Because that is how this state became what it is. Yeah. My question to you is with the destruction of our communities and taking away our public schools, getting rid of our teachers, our principals, and our superintendents, how do we teach the next generation who they are, what we have been, who we have been, so that we can continue the rise. Thank you for the work that you are, you are doing. Uh, you know, I've thought a good deal about um, the, you know, what to do in these um, dire uh, situations. And I do reflect on our history and think, oh, well, you know, what did our forebears do? Well, you know what they had to do. They had to educate people themselves, right? And so if we can't do it in the schools, we've got to create our own conclaves, okay? Um, and we've got to do it. So what I see growing up in this country um, is an effort among um, uh, people to uh, supplant what is being removed from them. Uh, I think that's a very good thing, but before we get there, our voices are the most powerful tool that we have. It really is. And so um, uh, we see all of these things taking place around us, but we don't see all of us out there saying we will not stand for this. Okay, and that's what's going to be required. Right. We're gonna have right. to insist on a different approach. Um, and we have to insist on it no matter where we are, okay? Um, and um, uh, the thing is that there will be a great risk to this, but um, as, people, as people take those risks, we have to be prepared to embrace them in whatever way we need to embrace them because this only succeeds if we are divided. Okay, All we right. cannot show ourselves to be divided on the issue of our rights um, as human beings, our rights as citizens, um, our rights um, to, the, to our story 
um, in the way that it actually occurred. And so I think that um, uh, people ask me all the time, what's going to happen now in the wake of the Supreme Court decision? And I, what I say to them is, um, we cannot say precisely what will happen, but what we do know is something will happen because we will find another way. I think about, you know, I think about people, uh, for example, who were forbidden to learn. They couldn't, you know, that used to be a, a, a rule. You couldn't, you couldn't learn. You couldn't, you couldn't learn to read. That was forbidden. Um, and so how did people learn to read? Surreptitiously, of course, okay? So we have to learn the, t the tools of our past that helped us get over the immense uh, barriers uh, to learning uh, because they are here again. Um, and if we are not loud enough in our descent, um, they will go deeper and do deeper. This is just the start uh, unless we speak up. We have one final question on this side. Uh, one last question. Is it on? Okay. Hello, first I wanna say thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to see you. Um, I'm Kayla Washington. I graduated in May of 2022 with my bachelor's in criminal justice. Um, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that you gave a little bit of a hard time when you were in college because I know that I've stopped you many times out on campus to ask you questions and I've bothered Dr. Copeland plenty of times. So I don't feel that bad anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad that um, you were here and you were able to share with us about your life and everything. And I want to say that I'm going to continue to follow you. Um, you inspire me. But I do want to know, as I continue to watch you and learn from you, what's next? What can we expect next from you? Oh, gee. Um, you know, here's the thing to know um, in your activism, okay? Um, I didn't know what would happen to me uh, when I decided um, to confront the Texas A&M system over its uh, outrageous conduct toward Fergie. Um, but I knew it was important to do that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know whether as a consequence of that, there would be nothing for me to do but to retire. But as soon as I did that, here comes Rice. Here comes Harvard. Um, uh, and I think it's fair to say that just about every month since then, I've gotten a new job offer, okay? Don't assume that by retreating and going along, you're going to have opportunity. Okay, don't assume that. And don't assume, by contrast, that just because you stand up for what you believe, that you're going to be damned for it, okay? The fact is, today, there are precious few people that uh, we look to who represent something fundamentally good and worthy, okay? They're just very few. If you do, you look at all the polls, and you'll see that people don't respect gov government, they don't respect pol political officials, they don't respect this person and that person and that person, okay? There is a crisis in this country around that issue of whom can we look to who stands for something that we can believe. So what you want most of all is to be a person who lives a life that is um, whole. And that means you are who you are. You represent who you are. You speak to who you are, and you are not going to let anybody turn you away from it. That, in the long run, is a better course than rolling over just because something is hard or because people don't like it. Mm. Dr. Sims. That is leadership. This is what leadership looks like. Sorry. Dr. Simmons, thank you so thank much you. for entertaining That's our leadership. questions. Um, I don't know about a chair. But I do know that you are a tambourine, melodically <laughs> amplifying the glory of our culture. You are a library with relentless and endless stories of True. leadership as well as home that we can all learn from. And you are a light. You are a, 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 a lighthouse shining and illuminating a way for us to continue to grow 
continue to be our better selves. And we are so proud of you, in addition to being so thankful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. spiritual ballad, the singing activist and visionary, Sam Cooke, captures the greatest life giver, the hope, the belief that change would come. If reading up home, one girl's journey, and hearing a story of triumph and trial, fail to stir hope in you and diminish fear in you, I don't know what will. For a, for in times painfully authentic narrative, Dr. Simmons, it bears witness to the indomitable courage, the spirit, of a people. We are made, it says in a good book, we are wonderfully and marvelously made. We have an upright spine and a plausible thumb and a complex brain for a reason that one generation will improve, will step on top of the top of the shoulders of the previous generations. I am reminded of a story from a fellow who was a dean and a provost at a school that we wiped off the map on uh, Labor Day. <laughs> we killed him. I'm sorry, he's here, but it, it, we, we did it. But he talks about coming out of a small town in Louisiana, a rural town, probably like Grapeland, Texas. And his folks didn't want him to come out of Louisiana to come to Texas to, co to come to college, but he did. But he said the thing about it was he'd go back home sometimes and go to church. You know, you go back home, got to go to church. And some of the sisters, the elderly sisters, would say to him, Do good, be good. And he'd look in the mail next week and he'd see a letter from one of these ladies, and there might be one dollar in there, and a, and a little note that said, be good, do good, and get you something nice. <laughs> he didn't think much of it. He was always very courteous, very nice. But one day when he'd finished college and he'd gone on to Michigan and gotten a PhD in linguistics, and he'd come back to be a dean and a provost at that school that we beat on, on Labor Day, he, he said that he observed the students. Many of them had all kinds of challenges, financial challenges. He said, but the one challenge that he saw that was so difficult for the students and the, to which he came to respond was that there were some who did not have anybody anywhere who could lend them a hand, not just a financial hand, but to encourage them, but to tell them to work hard. And so he says that that experience caused him to become more understanding and to really, in, really become a bridge builder. Our theme is that we produce productive people and we at Purview, when we say excellence lives here because we build 
bridges that others who come will be able to cross. Dr. Simmons, a bridge builder, an American treasure. In fact, excuse vernacular, I say, you're a bad mamma jamma. <laughs> In every way, a bad mamma jamma, personally, professionally, and we thank, we thank God for you. Miss Juliana Richardson, I don't think there's anybody living who cares more, who knows more about the importance of preserving a history, making sure it's neither lost nor stolen or never known or unknown. And for that, we, 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 you, we, we, we thank you because we know at the Library of Congress there, the, the WPA, Work Progress Administration, the 1930s, the slave narratives, but also, Library of Congress now, you have the History Makers Archive. You have that database. I really, just I'm still in awe that, I, that I'm just so thankful that I was able to put these two together because I didn't say we're going to have the, the, the launch and for me to be able to get you, Ms. Richardson, to say yes, even though you had a, have a gig in New York in the morning or something, you say, hey, for Ruth J. Simmons, oh, what time do you want me there? Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> anytime. I want to thank all of you for coming, particularly the, we have a students over here from the Carver Magnet School for Arts and Humanities and Engineering. We have the Prairie View Foundation, the Prairie View A&M Foundation, the Prairie View A&M University National Alumni Association. We have some elected officials. We have past and present. Uh, Mr. In Prairie View, Ms. Prairie View, the SGA president. Anybody I'm missing? The faculty senate. And I want you to know, there. I, mean, I look around here and I see faces, Miss Carrie and others that, you know, I've been here a long time. And whenever I've called, when I said we're having something that I think you really need to be part of, you didn't hesitate. You said, what, what time do you want me there? And I want you to know I appreciate that. At this time, I'm going to ask our president, the ninth president of Prairie View a &M University, the place to which I always refer as the brightest sun in the southwestern sky to come forward to help me make a presentation. Dr. Legrand. Would you come forward, Dr. Dr. Simmons? We'd like to make this presentation to you on behalf of everybody here and everybody who would love to have been here. Thank you so much. She thinks it's a shirt that's, you know, those shirts we had made that the students had made, Ruth the Truth. She said she doesn't need any more of those. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. And would you stay, stay, Dr. Legrand? Yes. Come forward. Oh. Miss Juliana Richardson. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to get all three of them together. Do you work, photographers? Oops, I should. Dr. Hope, I'm going to take them back. Keep your arms going. <laughs> <laughs> for this milestone of a program 
uh, this, 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 this wonderful day we've had with Dr. Simmons and with uh, Ms. Juliana Richardson, I want to thank some folk, starting with our president, Dr. Tamikia P. Legrand, the 20 Morrison Writing Committee, Dean Dr. Dory Gilbert, the planning committee, including but not limited to Ms. Carol Campbell, Ms. Candace Johnson, Mr. John Briscoe, Ms. Jadonna Barnett, Ms. Charlene Subblefield and her staff, Ms. Demetria Howard, Trellis Reese, Jay Petters, and if I didn't call your name, get me later. But it takes a village. It takes a village. It takes a village. It took a village to grow, to create this American treasure. It's taken a village to, pro to, 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 to promote and develop the work of the history makers. It's taken a village to keep Prairie View, to keep it what has been described as being a treasure of value and institution of the first class in every way. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. And two announcements, two announcements. Books for students, the students' books, courtesy of none other than Dr. Simmons, uh, upstairs in the ballroom. When you leave, the students, high school students and the college students, they go up. Uh, books are available through uh, Amazon, through Target, um, where, as, they, as they say, wherever books are sold. Um, and I do want to announce the next program, the next program for the Tony Morrison Writing Committee on the 28th at 11 o'clock in the morning, on the first of Thursday, the 28th of September this month, we will have our writer in residence. You know, the first year was Nikki Giovanni, the second year was Kevin Powell. This time we have Ms. none other than Ms. Attica Locke. Some of you know her work on Netflix. Uh, uh, the the recent, most recent one is From, from, from Scratch. And uh, her books, Bluebird, Bluebird. And she will be here to talk about uh, film because she's in fiction, but also very strong in television and film. I'd like to see you there. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Oh, oh uh, you got to say something else? Are you through? She said she's through. She's gone. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.